Hello and welcome back to Thoughts Per Chapter, Birth of a Killer edition. Today we will be exploring Chapter 2 of the book, Birth of a Killer, by Darren Shan, the author. We ended off last chapter with Lars and Verhorst and uh, rushing off to their workplace uh, because they think that it's going to be a head daubing day. They think their heads are going to get daubed. This chapter begins with them making their way, quote, through the narrow, filthy streets to the factory. Though it was early, the city was already bustling with life. In these dark autumn months, you had to make the most of the sunlight, unquote. And just a little personal preference here, I love that it's mentioned that it's autumn. Of course, you have the whole thematic thing of summer's over, as in like, maybe childhood is about to be over, innocence is about to be over, spooky month could be upon us, all that stuff is there. But I just fucking love autumn as well. Dropped an F-bomb within the first minute, damn it, that's on me. The market stalls are, quote, a place of magic and mystery, and Larton and Verhorsten are portrayed as being adventurous in that they would go to these Sunday markets and look at the wares from these other countries and dream about what it would be like to go to these other countries. At least that's how it is for the Sunday market stalls, but the market stalls that the boys have to navigate around to get to their place of work, their factory, is not quite so wonderful. We get this detail that certain traders lash out at any child who comes within striking distance because one street urchin looks much like the other, and yet despite this, Ver wants to become one when he comes up. Not a street child, he's already one of those. He would like to be a trader, and Larton agrees, saying that they could hunt elephants and sell their tusks, and I have to wonder just what Larton thinks the street vendors do in their free time. I love that childlike innocence of like, oh, you know, the teachers sleep in the school, like the, the people who sell stuff in their market stalls hunted it themselves. They come to an arrangement that Larton could hunt the elephants, uh, whereas Ver could sell the tusks, uh, because Larton wants to be scrappy and in combat, and he wants to be a, be a combat man with the adventuring and the hunting and so forth, and Ver wants to be the trading man, so we'll see how that works out for them. I love the detail that they don't know what elephants look like, and uh, the details have been embellished so they're as big as five houses and have 20 tusks. And Larton wants to take one of these on the balls on this lad. I don't know if guns exist yet. I guess they do. I guess they probably do. Yeah, we get some indication of the actual time period. The 19th century is new here. It's described as being an era of adventure where people go to different countries and hunt wild animals and... and come back with crazy stories and that's what dreams amount to for your common street rat at this point in time and you can picture it right if you've grown up in this industrial city uh with these dirty streets bustling with people you know that's what the kind of like opposite is right you go to this this sunny country somewhere where you know you can make your own life and you can you can hunt animals bitches uh, not exactly ethical, but then we're not worried about ethics at this point in time. It's a little like how kids dream of going to space nowadays, right? So they arrive at work early, uh, 15 minutes early to be precise, and as predicted, Traz is there, quote unquote, with a wicked glint in his eyes, so that is the first mention we get of Traz's character, and he is deeply suspicious of them turning up early, probably because he wanted an excuse to beat them. Um, also, I've been calling him their taskmaster. He's actually described as their foreman, you know, phrasing, but it's pretty much the same thing I would say. I have a frog in my fr But yeah, just clearing that up there. We're told that Traz is brutal, but that he keeps profits up, uh, so they don't really care what he does to them. Uh, which is lovely to hear, and he's been there for a long time. One of the things Traz hates about Verhorsten is his intelligence, likely because Traz doesn't have much of his own. Perhaps he feels threatened by the idea that as Verhorsten grows, he might use that intelligence against him, who knows. Trying to understand why someone who likes to beat children likes to beat children isn't exactly a great use of our time. But we're basically given the impression that Verhorsten has to hide his intelligence at times. Which is just tragic, isn't it? You get the impression that Verhorsten is just one of many children who could have really made something of himself, but the societal system let him down. Then we get the aggressive application of the hair dye that I alluded to last episode. Here's a paragraph. Bend over, he grunted, and grabbed a bag of Larson's neck. Thrusting the boy down, he reached into the bucket of orange dye with his brush, swished it from side to side, then ran the coarse bristles over the top of Larton's scalp. 
The die stung, and a few drops trickled into Larton's eyes, even though he kept them squeezed shut. The start of this book truly is just child abuse, the story. We do get some foreshadowing with how rough Chaz is with the Horston, how he thrusts his head down into the barrel, how the Horston is coughing and crying and gasping for breath when he's finally let go. We get the full description about how the different colours uh, of hair denote the different professions, uh, the different tasks that they're meant to be doing so that at a glance Traz can tell if someone's where they're not meant to be. I said that that was a bit like how sheep get you know marked uh, last episode. It's also like how cattle get marked you know that kind of thing. The workers are little more than livestock. It's mentioned that Larton can't remember what colour his hair was before he started working as a cocooner at the age of eight. I like to think it was ginger anyway, and Traz is just cruel enough to be like, ah, fuck you, that's not getting you out of a daubing. But given that these boys are mentioned to be less than teenagers, it goes to show the trauma of like, they can't have been working there for more than three or four years, and they cannot remember what life was like before then. Also, the fact that we know that Larton lives to be about 200 years old really emphasizes just how permanent this hair dye is. Those chemicals cannot be good for you. Larton wouldn't be surprised if the dye had even turned his brain a dark orange colour. There's something to think about. They worked in the factory for 12 hours a day, 6 days a week, and 8 hours on most Sundays, with no more than a handful of holidays every year. They're little more than slaves. And it's mentioned that some are worse off than Larton and Ver, so blimey, I'm glad I didn't exist back in those days. Again, no, this is going to feed into Larton's uh, character when he becomes a vampire, who are all about hard living, as I mentioned last episode. You have to wonder if a lot of the beliefs of the vampire clan are the way that they are because the vampires live for hundreds and hundreds of years so you have a lot of people who were brought up in a lifestyle like this living in the 21st century. We'll talk more about that as we meet them. Slaves are actually mentioned here. Some of the children were slaves brought by Traz from poor or greedy parents. The slaves worked constantly except for when they slept. So yeah, they could have been worse off, I guess, jeez. I do wonder if Darren the author toyed with the idea of making Larton a literal slave. Again, it's so tragic to read these passages, knowing that stuff like this did actually happen. A society existed which just burned the lives of kids as fuel for their industry. It's very Dickens, isn't it? The factory primarily produced carpets and silk clothes, so these are valued more than children's lives. Damn, this chapter's kind of a downer. I mean, I, I, what, what did you expect from a book called Birth of a Killer, I guess? We get this wonderful description of how the business of harvesting silk is actually done, uh, and how moths were kept in a warm room, countless thousands stacked on wooden trays from floor to ceiling, munching away. Larton had been in the room a few times, and the sound was like the rain falling on the roof of their house during a storm. That's really interesting, like, I don't know if factories, I mean, factories like these probably did exist, but it's not the kind of thing that I've ever really known about. It's almost otherworldly to picture, and I guess you could argue that the moths were being exploited and used just like the children. In fact, it's just come to me, uh, it's mentioned how these silkworms are basically boiled alive after they have fulfilled their usefulness, just like Ver Horsten is about to be. That's a messed up bit of foreshadowing, isn't it? We learn that the children in Larton's group have to stick their hands in boiling hot water to do their work, and we get this description of a time when Larton first did it and Traz watched Larton trying to put his hands in the hot water, recoiling, and then Traz just comes along and throws them down inside the hot water, despite Larton's pain, and that's more foreshadowing. The idea of Traz gleefully causing pain, thrusting something down into that hot water, that'll probably happen again. Again, I've put full spoilers in, up here in the, in the video window, so I think we could. This one might be a reach, but as Larton studies his fingers and notes that they're calloused, stained, and cut in many places, I am reminded of the scars that you get for being a vampire in this world on the fingers. That's more foreshadowing. Larton is worried about these cuts, leading to Larton losing fingers or dying of blood poisoning. We get this lovely description of children trying to hide their gangrene so that the affected limbs won't be cut off. Traz would attend to this with glee. We get a glimpse of Larton's courage as he says that if this were to happen to him, he hopes he would be able to cut it off himself to deny Traz 
the glory. Then Darren the author does this nice thing, uh, which I think he does in a lot of his writing, where he kind of like weaves the whole like internal monologue exposition uh, into dialogue. So while Larton is, you know, examining his hands, so that we as readers get to see, uh, like, learn about the whole how his hands are calloused and how infection can be a thing uh it then transitions into the making fun of him for being worried about his hands and then we've got dialogue and the action has moved on just a nice little writing flourish that i i like i mean darren the author isn't the only person who does this but i just i just like it when i see it and the chapter ends with larton thrusting his hands into the bubbling vat of boiling water which still hurts until his flesh adjusts to the pain what a cheerful chapter that was chapter two thank you for listening leave a like if you like the video leave a comment if you've got anything to say about the chapter and i will see you back here uh maybe tomorrow i'm considering doing these daily it depends how far ahead i get in reading these uh so if the first video has like popped off and got hundreds of views and people have been talking about it then thank you in advance uh i'm afraid i won't know about it for a while because i am recording some of these in advance if it's got two views, I probably look very silly right now, but them's the breaks. I'll keep doing this if it gets no views, it's too fun not to.